Hello guys and girls and welcome to a new tutorial. Today's video is a request. Somebody has asked how we can set up a beam particle system to act like lightning. Now you will notice that right now I have the viewport frozen. Uh, and the reason that I have the viewport frozen is just because before we begin, I do just want to give out a quick warning for photosensitivity and those of you that do suffer with it. Due to the nature of these particles, there are going to be a lot of rapid movements and some bright lights. So if you do suffer with photosensitivity, please do be careful going ahead with this tutorial. Uh, due to the nature of the particles, I'm going to be making them in a much slower fashion than normal. So when they do play, they're going to be moving slower than some users may want. But I am going to show you how you can set up the speed so that if you wanted these to be faster or slower, you'll be able to change that. With that out of the way, let's begin. So here you can see I've got a few different little beams here that are just going from one sphere to another. And if we were to move these spheres around, you can see that our particles will follow both their target and their source. And this is something else I'm going to be showing you guys how to set up. So let's get rid of all of our lovely little pieces and we will begin. The very first thing that we're going to do is we're going to make a material and it's just going to be very, very simple. Because these are just a beam, we just need something there to, to be a color for us. So we're just going to make a material and we'll call this lightning underscore M and we'll open this guy up. And we'll just change our blend mode to translucent and our shading model to unlit. And then we will right click particle color so that we can change our particle color inside of our particle system rather in the material. And we'll plug that into the emissive color. And then just to get our little pattern, we're just going to use a radial gradient exponential, which we will then multiply by holding M and left click by the alpha channel of our particle color. And this will allow us to change how see through our lightning will be inside of our particle system. So we'll plug this into the opacity. So we'll press apply there and we'll close this down and then we'll right click particle system and we'll call this lightning underscore P and we'll open this guy up. And before we mess around with the actual particles, we're just going to go to our required tab and drag our material in like so. And then we can just drop our particle system down onto our ground in our world so that we can see it in real time in our world rather than real time inside of the uh, particle editor. Now what we're going to do is we're going to set up the actual beam. So we're just going to maximize this. We're going to right click type data and we're going to set beam data. You'll notice that it's disappeared and the reason it's disappeared is because it's just switching over the data. It will reappear shortly and we should just get a strange line that looks like it's growing in random directions. See, if we, you can see it here. It hasn't got the material on it yet, but you can see we've got a line growing in a random direction. There we go. Now we can see that we're getting a little bit of our material in there, but because we have a color over life, it's disappearing. So what we're going to do is we're going to delete color over life because we want this to just persist. We'll right click and then we will go to color, initial color, and we'll just leave it as it is for now. That's looking cool. And we're just gonna give it a nice bright blue. We're just gonna ramp the value up to about 20 so we get a nice glow in there. Now what we're going to do is we're gonna actually set this up so that it stops moving around quite so randomly and that we can set this up with both a target and a source. Because we're using a beam data, we now have access to new menus in our right click, one of which is beam, and we can just simply set up source, like so, and beam target. Now, to get these to actually work inside of our world, we need to give them somewhere to go towards. So you can see right now it's kind of trying its best based on the default values in here, which are 50, 50, 50 to 50, 50, 50. If we were to go ahead and change some of these values around, we'd get a different source. So if we were to say maybe 500 on the Z, you can see now it's flying up because it's trying to reach that point. But we're not going to be using that. What we're going to be using is a different method. So our source method, we're going to set this to actor. And then you can see we have source name. This is very important because this is essentially a variable that's going to tell our particle system where to, uh, where to point what we're going to be using. But to access that, we need a name. So we're just going to call this source, nice and simple. And now we can assign an actor to our source name of source. And we'll do the same in target, change this to actor, and the target name 
we'll just call this target and we'll save this real quick. And then what we can do with our particle selected, you'll notice we don't actually have access to any sort of um, variables right now. We can't see anything. We can't see any of our source or our target that we've just created. To get access to this, what we need to do is under instance parameters, we just need to add two new elements under element zero. We're going to type in source. Parameter type is an actor. because This is how we've set this up. And in our second one, target, parameter type, actor, because that's what we've called it. And now if we were to say drag in a sphere and just duplicate this by holding alt and dragging, what we can do is we can select our particle and underneath our source actor, we now have actor and a drop down. We can use the little eyedropper, click on an actor for a source, and now you can see that we moved our particle to our source. And then what we can do is we can eyedropper our target. This isn't going to work right now. And the reason this isn't going to work is because our particle isn't lasting long enough to reach its target. So if we were to go into our lifetime and set our lifetime to zero, then our particle will just live forever. We, but you'll notice that it's going to reach its maximum height and then it's going to snap to our target. And the reason this is happening is because by default, beams are set up with a speed that pushes them in their velocity. We don't need any velocity, but if we turn this off right now, we're probably not going to get anything happen. Here we go. You see, it's just slowly creeping along towards its target. To change this, we're going to open up beam data and we have speed, which is currently set to 10. We're just going to set this to zero, which makes it instant. And now you can see if we restart the level in the sim, it will just immediately pop up on its target and we can move the target and it will update the particle and we can move the source and it will also update the particle. It's a little bit big, so we're just going to change the initial size to a constant. We're going to set this to maybe five like so on all. And now we have a much thinner line. It's probably still a little bit too thick, but we can change that later. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to change our spawn up a little bit because we're getting a constant of 20. We don't need our constant to be 20. So we're just going to set this to zero and our burst list. We're just going to make sure this is one. However, a beam will always be present anyway, but we're just going to set this up just for the sake of having it there in case we wanted to change some of this around later on. So how can we make this wavy? Well, if we right click and head to beam, we have noise. And with noise selected, we can tick low frequency enabled. And if we increase our frequency to say something like 20, you can see now it's trying to move things around. It can't currently move them correctly because we don't have any interpolation points. Right now, we just have point A and point B. For noise to work, we need points between the two, uh, between the two initial points of A and B, the start and the end locations. To do this, we're going to head to beam data and under interpolation points under beam, we're just going to increase this to something like 20. And this will give us some more points to use. You can see that shifted it ever so slightly as well. But it's still not quite doing what we need it to do. So what we're going to do is we're just going to change our noise range. Right now, our noise range is just a constant of 50, 50, 50. It's just pushing all of the interpolation points in exactly the same direction. We're going to change this over to a vector uniform which has now set it back to default because everything is zero. And if we say max of 20, max of 20, max of 20, this is where it's going to start to wiggle. So before we increase this any further, I want to talk about the speed. To change the speed, if we scroll down inside of our noise, we can find noise speed. And if we were to open this up, you can see we have a constant which allows us to set up a noise, but then we can offset this with the noise lock time. Zero, it's just gonna rapidly flick between different noises. The higher the number, the slower this will be. So for now, I'm just gonna set this to one, which is just gonna make it step between noise frequencies once every second. So you can see here it's blinking once every second. Obviously, if you want this to be fast, set it to a lower number. For the sake of the tutorial, and for those with a photosensitivity, I'm gonna leave this going quite slowly for now. So we have our noise set up, we've got 20, 20, 20, and we can push this as well into our negative to negative 20 so that we get a bit more noise going downwards. 
Now you can see we're getting this really nice jittering in there, which is really, really cool. Like so. Now, obviously, if we had this going a little bit quicker, it would look a bit more dynamic than it currently does. But as I say, for this, for the sake of safety, I'd rather keep it quite slow for you guys. And now that we've got one in there, we can right click, we can say emitter, and we can duplicate this, say if we wanted two beams, and now we have two beams instead of just the one. And because they're using a frequency within a range, the odds of them lining up is very, 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 very slim. So we're always going to get a little bit of a, a wiggle in there. What we are just going to do is we're just going to change this size down to maybe three on both of them, like so. So this is this is all looking grand, and we can now move our our targets around. But what if we didn't want it to be a straight line? What if we wanted these to arc a little bit? If we wanted them to arc, we can use something called a tangent, which is very similar to those little squares that you use to drag around your paths if you were drawing in Photoshop to make curvy lines a bit more curvy. To use these, we can head into our source and we can scroll on down and we have a source tangent. By default, this is just going to be set to 100. If we were to change any of these values, it will curve in that axis. So for example, if we say Z of maybe 20, we'll start to get more of a curve into the 20 point, uh, into the Z axis rather. Although as we're going quite slow, we might not be able to see this right now. So I'm just going to turn off the noise. There we are. Oh, our source method, of course, I've left it as direct. That's why we can't see. So we're just going to set this to user set, and this will allow us to determine the arc. So you can see here now we're getting this curving upwards. And if we do to do the exact same in our target of 20, it will go underneath. So we'll get this curvature going under. We need to also change this to user set. There we are. So you can see now it's curving upwards, and then it's coming back down again. So now we don't get quite as good of a camera facing here because we're you know we're pushing it via a tangent but if we were to turn our noise back on we can still see it but now we're getting curvature upwards and a curvature downwards so you can see here we're going up and we're going down if we wanted them to both be curving upwards we would um, oh this is what this is 20 that's why the curve isn't very high there we go um if we wanted the curve to be upwards just in a nice smooth arc what we would do instead of putting positive in both we would set the target to negative 50 to get the opposite effect. Now we get this nice curve over the top. Like so. Now we'll just head back in and we'll just turn the noise back on for our other one. Now you can see we've got this nice arc over the top. And of course we can set this to a much lower value if we wanted negative 10. Like so. Just to give it a little bit of an arc there and just separate these two beams like so. Now we can move this around and there you go. And obviously if you were to move our sphere here inside of a blueprint, because our particle system has targets set up, it will just always follow your target point. So there you are everybody, some, some nice, uh, really easy beam lightning for you. Um, obviously if you wanted this to flash, just turn off the emitter after a certain amount of time. Right now we've just got it set so that it's just looping infinitely, so it's just gonna keep going. Um, you can use a blueprint to disable it or re-enable it. If you wanted it to flash rapidly, just use a delay to turn it on and off. But there you are. Obviously, don't make these things go too quick. You don't wanna give anybody, you don't, you don't wanna make anybody ill. Um, and this is why I say that I've got this set to, to be really, really slow. Um, but there you are. Have fun with that. It's, uh, it's a really neat little trick. Uh, have a play around with your, your tangents. You can go ahead and you can make these tangents move around with a blueprint if you were so inclined um, to do so under your source tangent. Under distribution, you would change your distribution vector constant to a distribution vector particle parameter. And then you could give that a name and inside of a blueprint, you could pull this name out and set your vector parameter to whatever you wanted so that you could change the values here on the fly in real time. So that you could make it look like it was waving if you were so inclined. But there you are, have fun with that. Thank you very much for watching. 
I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.